Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Kenny Conversation, brought to you by Jags. Where's that die cast? The leader in high performance aftermarket car parts. Remember to go to Jags.com, and they're telling me to tell you truck parts, Jeep parts, anything you need. I say this all the time how lucky we are here on Kenny Conversation to have the greats. And uh, I have friends, but there's a handful that are closer. And this next gentleman, my dear friend, Ron Caps. Ron, welcome to Kenny Conversation. You got friends in low places, Kenny. <laughs> no, I don't. You're <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Where are you at, buddy? That's beautiful in the background there. This is, this is our home, and it's beautiful because, well, first of all, my wife, we never had any racing stuff. I, I know you've gone through this. So for years, no racing stuff was allowed in the good part of the house, right? Right. Which was great, and I'm glad. Otherwise, it'd be like it'd be like behind you. I'd have all my knickknack teenager stuff. But once we won the first championship, Mellow Yellow, right there. I love it. 2016, it was allowed into the front, the family room. It so, looked like furniture. Oh, good. yes. Then yeah. we won the second one, which is Camping World, and it was allowed into the family room. So now they, now I sit and watch my flow racing or my dirt racing, and watch you and. I watch the TV and there's the two trophies and it just reminds me. So I, I, it, I've moved up in the world where my racing stuff has made it into the family room now. You know, there, there's so much to be said about that. You know, Kenny conversation, I always remind everybody it's just that, but I went into the great Dick trickle, you know, one of the greatest racers of all time, circle track racer, but I went into his house and there was nothing in there. Just, couldn't tell he was a race car driver. And I learned at an early age that sometimes we keep racing out of our house because there's an old saying that competition will kill you. It just eats your brain up. But uh, when you've done what you've done, uh, three-time champion, those those are nice pieces of furniture. They can, they can double this furniture. I agree. Yeah. Well, listen, let, let's get right at it. Um, I've kind of been doing something here lately with some of the great ones like you. Uh, and then I want you to respond. So listen to this. Uh, Ron Caps, driver and owner of the Napa Auto Parts Toyota Supra. But he, here, here's what I want you to listen to close. Three-time NHRA Funny Car Champion. As of right now, I, and help me, 76 wins? Yes. Yeah. 70, 76 wins. You have drove for the greatest and a lifetime of memories in drag racing. It, it, it takes a while to get to 76 wins and knock out three championships. And, and not very many p people can do it, Ron. When I say that, what goes through your mind? It's weird hearing you say it. It still is. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's weird That's to you. me. Uh, the 70, I forget what win it was when I tied my hero, the, the legendary Don Perdon, who I got to work for. And it's weird because those numbers were lower because back in the day, and again, you can relate to this because things were different back then. Um, there was a lot of match racing. That's what that's what made the snake and the mongoose and Raymond Beetle, the Blue Max and all these, you know, Shirley and Big Daddy. When when they were at their height. You know, it was match racing. You could go see a drag race, see the snake and the mongoose, literally. I got goosebumps right now. I'm about ready to cry because yeah. those are my days. Tuesday night, a Wednesday night. You could see them at some small track in the middle of America. And uh, so the national event, NHRA, national event numbers weren't always huge for some of our heroes in drag racing, for sure. And I'm sure it's that way in, in NASCAR as well. A lot of small tracks where they weren't necessarily a NASCAR win. In the so early a lot more wins than uh, and trophies. Probably Dick Trickle probably had ten times most of the. Richard Petty basketball. had two hundred wins, but they ran a hundred times a year, so hard to compare. And they ran at dirt tracks. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, seventy six. When to hear you say all that is it's strange to me. It still is strange. The, the championships I fought, and I was runner up to probably. I, I was the Cinderella story. Literally, the media. I mean, until I won finally in two thousand sixteen. I was more known for not winning and coming down to the wire and coming this close to probably four or five in my career that let down to the last day at Pomona where we had a shot at winning and didn't. So those came quick. All of a sudden, 
you know, with this 2016 and then all of a sudden, boom, we won another one in 21. And then last year won it again, which was my first year as an owner. So yeah, it, when you say those words, it's still weird to think I got to do it for a living for this many years, 28 or 29 years. And um, I still sounds like you're introducing somebody way cooler than I am when you say all that. I, I'm thinking about the, uh, we lost a great one, the country music singer, Kenny Rogers. They said he was a, Kenny Rogers was a, 40 year old overnight sensation. So you're 58 years old right now. So you're, you're telling me you, you're a 50 year old overnight sensation. It, Pretty much, and, and I've said that to people before. Yeah. I, <laughs> literally I grew up on the sport and again, a lot like you, I, I've, I've read about you and heard you talk. My dad raced on weekends. He's a drag racer in central California, small track. And I always worked on him, but I knew I wasn't going to have millions or a sponsor or a lot of backing to take, to get a ride. Like, we see in the world today so i just i knew i if i ever got a chance if one person gave me a shot at getting my license in a dragster mm. i better n know what's going on in the car and mechanically so all those years of being a crew guy and working on them and helping set them up it worked when i got my chance to get a license i did really well because i felt like i'd been in the car um and also i think when i got to work for like don perdome that first year driving the copenhagen car i went from just being a, a guy wanting to to do it for free to be in, in this rock star world of the biggest sponsors in the world, driving for the biggest name. But all those years of working on it taught me when to shut the car off when I thought something was wrong, which wasn't always, but most of the time. And I saved a lot of parts, a lot of money, and more importantly, a lot of work for the crew guys. Because I was one, I didn't want to bring back a hunk of junk blowing up to the crew guys to have to work all night. And then me grab the rental car keys and go, all right, I'll see you guys in the morning. I'm off to a dinner. So I, I think that really helped my career later on as a driver. Man, you're just you're just hitting me with all these notes. I mean, I I, I worked hard on you, and you you just you just went bam, 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 bam. And, and these are things I want to talk about, but I'm going to call an audible. Um, when you when you think of, and we're going to get to the U.S. Nationals in just a minute. Uh, we haven't even started the Kenny conversation yet, <laughs> but we haven't. It's crazy. That's how good you are. You're loaded with. You're a great speaker, and that's why you have a great sponsor like Napa. But I want to call an audible here. Um, you you mentioned it earlier. Uh, snake versus Mongoose, match racing, Shirley, Cha Cha, Muldowney. I mean, I really, I mean, I I, got, I really got goosebumps. I mean it. Uh, very emotional for me, and I know people were crying in line when they come to get the snake's autograph up there at Indy. Don, I guess my question is, like anything in life, were those were those magical days in drag racing? Will we ever see anything like that again? No. No. It was awesome. It, it was <laughs> awesome in a lot of different sports and arenas in the world. But for drag racing, oh, my gosh. Um, you know, I played with those Hot Wheels. I built those little models and... Then as I fast forward and obviously getting to drive for the snake, but getting to hang out with a guy like Waterbed Fred and, and yeah. meet, Raymond, meet Raymond Beetle and uh, Big Daddy Don Garlitz and get up and speak at an event with him and just crazy stuff for me as a kid where most of when I was growing up, I mean, you know, all of my friends wanted to be astronauts and firefighters and all the cool stuff. Well, you kind of are. You're staying on Earth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> True. <laughs> you wanted to be Don Perdon yeah. or Tom McHugh and the Mongoose. You know, that that was why I wanted to do. So, think, you know, I, I, I always said I was born 25, 30 years too late because I felt oh. like if I could travel the country with a ramp truck, right, and have a sponsor mm. and race every night of the week or just about and go town to town and just pack up and show up, unload the car and put on a show and have fans pack them in on a Wednesday or Thursday night and drag race for a living and make a living doing it. I thought, how could it get any better? I mean, it, there's, there's just no way. So a lot of, I think a lot of reasons back then was way cooler. And we don't have the nicknames. We don't have the cars with the old school nicknames. It's all sponsors and stuff on them. Um, but for, I think you and I and people our age grew up in such a perfect time in the world. We came right at the right time in cars in general and just cool cars and muscle cars and racing and yeah, never going to be the same going that way. And I think, you know, we just, it, we perfect timing. You bring up a, I don't, I don't know if this is a conversation, but what was it about those days? It wasn't Don Garlitz. It was big daddy. You know, it wasn't yeah. Don Perdome. It was the snake, you know, it wasn't Shirley. It was cha-cha. Uh, 
man, we just, it, it, every, it, that was the thing back then. And it, it made, it made for a lot of fun, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Great, great childhood. I mean, I, I yeah, great. Just a great childhood for me. I mean, you know, it was everything in the world to get a new model that came out right? <laughs> yeah. or a, a new Hot Wheels set, you know, and set that thing up and have the parachutes pop out. And just it was just a great. And then to go to the track and actually meet See it. the snake and the mongoose or, or Brayman Beetle or Big Daddy Don Garlitz. That, yeah. That's that was what made it cool, I think. All right. Let's let's get to it now. And the reason. For everybody out there that is just joining Kenny Conversation, the reason we're looking back is uh, because the man you're looking at right now, Ron Caps, just won the U.S. Nationals. And it was completely badass because it was unbelievable. It was very emotional. Of course, Ron, you had the Hot Wheels car, and then you took the chance to, to bring the snake in. You brought him in, and you had the pressure of him staring at you. And <laughs> and, you, and, and you're like, yeah, there he is, man. And and you do it, you win it all. You win the U.S. Nationals. Just capsulate that that week for me. It was a few months of breaking down sometimes, thinking it's not going to happen. I mean, nowadays to do something like that is so many attorneys and so many things you've got to jump through to get it to happen. And we did what, what the Hot Wheels people told me because I was on them all the time. And I was dealing with all these people with the word global in their title and their email. Um, yeah. And it it was uh, they said I did about a year and a half's worth worth of work in about three and a half months putting that deal together because it was an idea. Then I had a rendering done and it was just craziness. And then I had to get the OK from the snake. Right. And um, we the guy that did our rendering probably made it happen more so because the rendering was so cool. We put it on a, a what is our car now is a Toyota super funny car. But the way that he did this Hot Wheels car the same car that you and I played with as kids and put that paint scheme on our car. It looked like it was a hot wheel from when we grew up and it had the modern day look. But uh, when I sent the text to snake, I was in a parking lot in Ohio on a Monday after a race and I, he was sitting and having coffee in bed. I woke him up and it, I said, I'm going to send you a text. I just want you to think about it. And uh, he was just quiet and he just kept saying the F word. <laughs> oh, <my laughs> yes. Yes, He's like, man. He's like, Jesus. He goes, are you serious? I go, yeah, I'm going to try to pull it off. I just need to know if it's okay with you. So, you know, Snake, it was first, it was an idea to do a surprise for him. And that ain't going to happen. He, I work for him and you know, I'm pulling a surprise off on him. is probably not the best idea, but um, crazy. And then just working hard to get it done. And then to have him show up and then to, you know, tell me, don't make this trip worth a waste to, for me to come out here if you're no, going to suck. Be more to ask when he's your hero. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we love but you, Snake. We love you. <laughs> he just got more and more excited. And he was asking me daily, how are things going? How are things going? And, you know, it was a slow process. And I can tell you, probably with the exception of a few days, and we've been a few weeks out now since we won that race, I've either heard from him text-wise or a phone call that he is still on cloud nine from that, that mm. day, that weekend, and that win. Just to hear him say that and the emotions that he had, we yes. went to a victory dinner that night and uh, it was just cool to see him. And you've gotten to hang out with him a lot here lately. You know, you guys go to Sturgis and you hang out a bit. He's a different person. He was when I drove definitely a different person when he drove. Cause I had beetle and waterbed and all those guys tell me how much of a dick he was yeah, back he then. Me I mean, hardcore yeah. hated. The the news. Yeah. You didn't want to drive for this guy back then. And you definitely didn't want to work for him unless you expected to be the best. And, and, um, and I saw a little bit of it, but he had mellowed a lot when I went to work for him. So I understood that passion for winning and why he is the snake. So it, it was cool to see him more relaxed and kind of just enjoying the weekend. Man, you, you just said so much right there. I feel like this is a therapy session for me now <laughs> because, because listen, you know, I'm, this isn't even a question. This is a conversation. You know, my, my brother, Rusty, he was mean. And I love my brother. And I, I love Mike. And I love my dad, mom. I love, you know, but just, you know, I learned that Rusty was in, like you mentioned earlier about you and me. I'm getting ready to go up and work on my dirt car here in a minute. You and I do it all. So with Rusty, if you wanted to win, you just did what the hell he told you to do. And when people would get in Rusty's way, and I think this is what you're explaining about Don, is that 
they knew what they needed to be done. And if you, if you got in their way, they just didn't have time for you. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny cause I'm a little more politically correct and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm it's a new time. times worried about hurting people, people's feelings at times. You're right. My brother. Yeah. <laughs> You're my brother. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it was a different era, but there's a reason those guys rusty. And I, and I got to hang at that time working for snake because of the Miller deal and got to go to a lot of races and watch Rusty in his prime. I mean, Bristol on a Saturday night. Such a bad to, You know, sponsored by Miller, you, you got to sit right there in the pit or be in the pit. So I got to see him, listen on the radio, the intensity. He was so much Don Prudhomme. And I think that's why they get along so well. Yeah. Um, him so and Walker fun. Evans, they're all mean. Yeah, Walker Evans. <laughs> <laughs> you like you that. Yeah. Them. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something that I don't know how much you can do, but you know, Jags has always been a part of me for 17 years. And uh, I did a small little hole shot years ago in the pro stock car. So here you are at the U S nationals. And what I'm going to ask you is it's something that's normal to you, but assume we have some new fans on here. So when does this, process of you getting in the car to me it's so claustrophobic way more than our cars um uh, and you get it i mean i feel that way what goes on and, and i don't want to be long-winded here but i mean you get the uniform on uh, not the uniform but you get in the car right before staging you're rolling up there now we got mind games the lights walk me through that process for the u.s nationals what, what does ron caps what are your idiosyncrasies? What do you go through? And just get me to the light. Yeah, you know, you say, it's funny because Tony Stewart finally got in a funny car here recently and, and he just kept fighting me. I said, dude, you're a funny car guy. Look at you. You're not a dragster guy. And yeah. I ribbed him at the awards when I won the championship. I ribbed him in front of the whole crowd for him to get in a funny car. And then he was he was joking with me, but he was mad that I made him go do it. So he jumped in a, a funny car here recently. And I'm like, this is a guy that's driven like you midgets and sprint cars and wing sprint cars. If you ever sat in an outlaw car, it's just as claustrophobic. I mean, you got the, the wing over you and you're down in there and you're hauling ass into these corners wide open. It's yeah. just different, right? You would love it. And it's not that much claustrophobic or maybe it is actually the more I think about it. Maybe <laughs> <the fire laughs> aspect. Yeah. But um, our cars are so much different in the fact that, we're center steer. So you're sitting in the middle of this chassis. I've got a little butterfly steering wheel. It takes two guys to buckle me in. And so when I raced SRX recently or the prelude to the dream or these w w sprint cars, I go jump in. It's funny because I'm you're always, like, I get in, I go like this and you know, and I'm, and they're what? looking at me like they're, I'm waiting for somebody to buckle me in and I forget, you know, you do it all yourself. So yeah. in, in the funny car, you get in and, and we have, 15 total straps. So we've got arm restraints, leg restraints, head from the back to keep our head from going forward. It's negative nine G's when a parachute's hit. And then I have these four straps in front because it's positive five and a half, six G's on a run. So you have all those straps that got to be hooked up. So once you do the burnout and you back up, um, you got to remember that we have a handbrake. We don't have a foot brake. We've got a clutch that's a centrifugal clutch, much like a mini bike. Like when you and I were a kid, well, it would sit at idle. You give it gas and it takes off. You don't need to use a clutch, right? RPM comes up, it starts to move. That's what the clutches basically are like in a top fuel or funny car. So when you're a fan and you're watching the drag races and those two little top lights called pre-stage light, that's basically once both cars get those done and you only go in and light those two top ones. You don't want to light any more than that or you're, you're sort of, you're not breaking a code, but you're just, you're not supposed to because those first two means you're about to be ready. So once both cars have those two little pre-stage lights, okay, now you flip your visor down, you turn your fresh air system on, mm. you do whatever else you got to do. In our case, you pull the fuel pump all, all the way on, 1001, 1002, and you let your foot off the clutch. And that's when you hear at the races, you hear the RPM drop a little bit. And when it happens, that centrifugal clutch is slightly loaded and I'm holding the car with the brake. Wow. I am, I am, I am like a Cobra with my foot ready to snap the throttle pedal and let go of the brake at the same exact time when the Christmas tree comes down eventually. So that's what we're doing in there. And we are, that's why we talk about John Forrest and him staging and playing games and waiting, because once you let your foot off the clutch, it starts building heat. 
Now, if you're in there and you're waiting and somebody's taking a little bit longer um, and pro stocks a little different because you have a clutch and you got the thing on a chip and you're bringing the RPM up. So they pro stock has their own way of staging. And again, people start to play games that could mess with the tune up in the car and get in somebody's head. So that's basically it. Other than that, we when we mash the gas on these funny cars and top fuel dragsters, we don't shift. A lot of people think that we make all these different shifts. They're, they're preset adjustments that the crew chief sets on those clutch timers. So once I hit the gas, there's a button under the gas pedal. It starts these timers and the crew chief has to set them before the run. And he's got a sort of educated guess of what he think the track will take. And you mash the gas and you hang on for dear life and you just mm-hmm. try to keep it straight. And, and it sounds easy. And in the top fuel dragster, it is easier. They're, they're longer. They're more forgiving. You, in a dragster, you steer it maybe this much at the most. You don't want to get no teeter-tottery, right? The funny car, you hit the gas, and it's this all the way down. And that's when a run looks straight from the outside. If you're in the tower and you see a pretty straight run, we're still in there going like this. Because it is so evil handling. Engines in front stiff chassis there's no suspension there's no noodleness like a top fuel car it is the most and i've gotten to drive some pretty cool cars dirt cars sprint cars midgets it is the most evil evil just you do not know what the heck it's going to do for the hell out of me i i I, you know just i was too old to do it uh yeah you would love it i'd love to put you in someday and just have you do a burnout and a launch i think you would you, you would you wouldn't stop talking. You would love it. So, you know, I want to get into um, a little bit. Uh, uh, now, did we just lose all, the great Austin Coyle? Uh, was that? No, uh, still alive. Still alive. Is he in yeah. trouble right uh, now? Who we lost was uh, Walt Austin, Pat okay. Austin's yeah. dad. Okay, yeah. yeah. Really sorry to hear about that. Um, I'm thinking about tuners and you talking about tuning your car. Uh I, I mean, now, now correct me. I mean, I'm, I'm a big, big rat drag racing fan. I love you guys. I, I'm coming Sunday here to uh, watch you race. I know that, you know, in our type of racing, you know, we don't want to spin the tires and we want to, we want to perfectly match our horsepower to the ground and that's going to win. Same with you. And I just kind of said it in a dummy way. How, how hard, and, and I know I'm taking a shortcut, but how hard is that to do uh, what you said, you know, tuning everything before you make your run, you know, air temperature track. Tell me all those idiosyncrasies once again, that go into matching that power to the ground. It is nuts. When you walk in our trailer, I'll show you our crew chiefs could literally be a better weather person on the local Mm -hmm. news than any of them. They know more about what's going on in the weather at the track. Um, He's got four or five that he's watching and, it is crazy because one little change and here's, I tell fans all the time, the real gearheads is, you know, we check altitude of the, near the track, we check the airport and they, they get a basic altitude. Well, you're going to, you're going to know what the temperature is. You kind of see at the forecast and then we have all these weather stations, but when you get to things like humidity, it's not just humidity. They break it down to, to pieces of water per parts of air. And that'll give them these water grains and it'll actually break it down that minute because a little small change in water grains, which is a fraction number of humidity, um, will it's change science. the tune-up compression ratio and things that they they do to these engines. Um, it is amazing to me how many things have to go right. One little timer off a little bit on a fuel system to rich in a valve where he may have added a little bit of clutch. And when you add a little clutch, it creates a little load on the motor. Well, you better add a little nitro. So I'm talking a tiny little twist of a knob and they've got, it looks like a nuclear plant in this timer box. And so everything has to be so perfect. I'm telling you, it's crazy. What, what has to go on for these cars to hook up and run 330 miles an hour in a thousand feet. It, It boggles me as a driver when I step on the gas and it flashes the five G's and then the clutch comes in about a second and a half in the run and it pins it up to close to six G's. And you're thinking, how on earth are these good years staying stuck to the track and catapulting me like I'm in a star Wars movie. It just goes, I mean, it's, it's nuts. And you, it it just, it's, it, they are, they're amazing. These crew chiefs, They, they didn't all grow up with mathematician brains, but what they've done and figured it out has it, 
the wor- if you could say the worst guy out there, then the 16th lowest crew chief and talent is still one of the most amazing minds to be able to figure out how to get these cars to go down there in my mind. And that's why I, I asked, I, I had an ideal. These are all the things you were going to say. And I think, the fan, <laughs> I think the fans, I think the fans are, you know, it, to me, it, it, it is, it's science and it is absolutely insane. So John Force, you you finished second to him. Like you mentioned this earlier, about 20 minutes ago. Uh, he, you finished second to him. And, you know, and they called Harry, Harry, Grant, Harry Gant and NASCAR run second a lot. They call him the bridesmaid. Yeah. You finished second to Force three times in the points, I think. More than, more than that. Three times on the last day by – very close margin enough. It could have gone either way, but many more times just second, you know, so, maybe not as close on the last day, but yeah. <laughs> so uh, me and Bobby Labonte, we are really good friends and, and I've got over it, but he broke my heart outrunning me for the championship back in 1991. And I tell people, I see, see that, that blink of my eye as, as, as Bobby Labonte, but now we love each other. Never did hate him. Just man, we were competitors. So, what about you and Force? I mean, you know, I know he's a legend. He's 75 years old, right? And he's still kicking ass. When I say John Force and what he put you through, and I mean this fun loving. Right. Give, give me your thoughts. I Fans come up all the time and they're like, I'm sorry about the hat. Take a picture. You know, they'll have John Force, everything. <laughs> and I'm like, I love John. John is one of the reasons I'm where I'm at. He took me under. When I was driving top field dragsters my rookie year before Funny Car, he took me under his wing at a small race in Spokane and taught me how to leave on a really crappy, crummy track and to, to, to make sure we got down the track for the fans. And I didn't know how to do that in a nitro car. And he there. taught me some cool stuff. And later on, he wanted to hire me. Before Don Perdome hired me, he was trying to hire me to be his second Funny Car team. He knew you was- had talent. He saw something in me and we, we got to hang out a lot and uh, I, it, it was, I could write a book, uh, but there's a lot of stuff in there. I couldn't put in there. It was just a lot of fun craziness you'd see in a days of thunder type movie, you know? And, uh, but but to answer your question, I, I am, I tell fans all the time, I am more than okay with being second to John Forrest at anything. Bristol dragway is the only place that I've won I don't know if anybody's won more races than John Forrest at. I think I've won. We won there again this year. I just have this yeah, right. great luck. And John, I've won one more race there than John Forrest, which you can't say. That. <laughs> Take that, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make a shirt up, I think. But um, he will never be caught the amount of wins he has. He will never be topped. Um, he is a freak of nature in a yeah. lot of different, a lot of different ways. He's still out there whooping our ass right now. Uh, he still comes up to me every Friday. He called me when I became a team owner and I was middle of January crying on a 10 PM, you know, not wondering even how I'm going to pull this off. He was calling and saying, whatever you need, kid, you need money. Do you need advice? What can I do to help? And this is the guy that I battle for, for my livelihood. He loves the sport. He needs you in it. And he, he calls all the time. I've got so many great voicemails saved on my phone. He's yeah. just, uh, he's got the a heart this big. And so I, I do not mind being second to him in anything. I, I it, it's I, again, talking about you and I growing up at a certain time in the world, I'm blessed and I'm going to be so happy to brag on how I got the race with the legendary John Force. Boy, I mean to tell you now, I, John and I did an autograph session, I think King of Prussia, Miller Motorsports, and we drove to the airport together in a rental car. Yeah. And, and, and I became so happy as Schrader would said, Schrader looks at me and goes, Herman, he says, you're so messed up. You make me feel good about myself. I wanted to look at Force and go, Force, you're so messed up. You make me feel good about myself. He he told me little little things that I'll never forget. He said, you know, on Sunday nights or whenever he gets back, he, he has to go to the mailbox. He's got to get the mail. He can't go home. And, you know, <laughs> in, in, in a weird way, I know how crazy he is, but, but not in, in a bad way. Just that mind's always just digging, you know, and. And that reminds me of you, though, in, in, a, in a calmer manner. So the next conversation is you are able 
to keep sponsors. You got it going on. Your, your website is awesome. Your social media is awesome. It seems like you got Paul with you, you know, at the right time. What is, what is it that you got personally? Because I, I believe you're the one that pulled this off. I know you got help, but you, you got it going on with Napa Auto Parts. You're, you're, you're good with them. What is it that you do that the other people don't do? Um, I've paid attention more than anything else. I mean, I learned early on driving for the snake. We would, you know, we'd go on Earnhardt's bus at a NASCAR race. So we'd go see Penske at an IndyCar race. And I was really always paying attention to the way these, these people operated and the way they were at the racetrack, the way their pit area was. I was always infatuated with the way Penske and, and snake would make comments. And I just always pick up on little things that people I wanted to emulate in life. Right. The right way to go about things. Yeah. I mean, the way scooters were parked in a perfect manner at a Penske pit area. Oh, that is Rusty Wallace. All the way. That's I'm, Rusty. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounds dumb. And I've told people this before, but I still, I'll pull our scooters up and I'll move them out in front of our pit area. It's those little things that obviously have worked for people, but it, it, it's just, you. yeah, it's just, um, I paid attention and I, I knew watching Snake that you had to have you had to have a good race car, but his one of his best sayings where you can't win the Kentucky Derby riding a mule. And, and you have meaning that if I was going to be a team owner, I better have the best team. We may suck at other things, but we better have a good race car on the track and it better be competitive. And I, I hit a home run because I've got a great team beyond that. They're great fun to hang out with, but I just, uh, I just paid attention. Uh, doing the first year in Napa, we were doing these commercials and Michael Waltrip was my teammate at the time. And, uh, Twitter was just on the horizon at that time. And he, he got me on Twitter while we were doing some downtime and it obviously became Twitter and social Twitter. media. He and he told Twitter. me I should probably jump. And I go, who gives a crap about what I'm thinking on a Tuesday afternoon? He said, I'm How's telling this you. going to make me money. Well, let me show yeah, you. <laughs> exactly. And so it's just those moments in life. And I think, should I listen to what I just heard from somebody or pay attention? And sometimes it's like, nah, they're full of shit. But sometimes you go, there might be something to it. And I've been lucky enough just to, to listen to the right people at the right time and, and try to pay attention, I guess, more than anything. Yeah, well, Ron, look at you. I mean, we, we could go another 30 minutes easily or five hours, but. Uh, <laughs> we need beer for that. Yeah, we even need beer. Um, I love you to death. And here's why. Because you've always been good to me. And I really appreciate that. Uh, I admire you because, uh, you know, we we kind of I don't know what it is, but we just we get along real well. And uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on Kenny Conversation. And uh, you're going on, and I'll I'll see you here on Sunday. You got it, man. I, I love the show. I love every morning having my coffee and listening to what you're going to rant about. Yeah. And uh, you're one of my favorite people. And and you're the first word out of my mouth when somebody says I'm going to be new on social media. Who should I follow? And it's always you. So. And thank you for Jags for sticking with you. Even when you're throwing F-bombs and all that other stuff, there ain't a lot of sponsors that would let somebody be themselves. And I, I brag on that all the time. Um, Jaggy and, and all those people there are just uh, salt of the earth. And um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm blessed to be on the show. I've been a huge fan and obviously a friend of yours. So thank you again for having me. Stop it. All right. Well, everybody, listen, remember, we are in podcast form. Uh, you can listen to us on the way to work and on your way back home. Uh, Spotify, iTunes, the Kenny Conversation just keeps on rolling. Until next time.